Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bale Donin Method with Dr. Gina Pritchard. Today, I'm here with Dr. Pierre Limegruber, an interventional cardiologist from Spokane, Washington. And Dr. Limegruber, I'm thrilled that you've joined us today, and I am very pleased uh, to let everyone hear the information that uh, you shared with us a couple of years ago in New Orleans at the Bale Donin Method reunion. And it's important uh, information as well as a very interesting story. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Gina. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and, and the audience about uh, my history. How do I, you know, went through all those years and how did I end up in Spokane, Washington and how fortunate I am right now to work with the Dr. Amy Donin and Dr. Bradley Bale. So before um, we get to the end here, I want to start where I was born and raised. I'm originally from Switzerland. I was born many years ago. As you can see on this uh, picture, we were a family of seven, mom, dad, and I have uh, four siblings. I was the last one on the bunch. I was about five years or, or, of age. We had a wonderful upbringing. We lived in a small little house that we, my, my dad rented. We worked for a big aluminum company and they provided the housing. My mom was a seamstress, and, and uh, all my siblings were a little bit older. I was a lot, the last one to come along. I want to share you something else as well, as you can see in this next slide here. And um, my dad, he had problems with his heart. My mom died also from a heart problem. My sister has heart problems. She's at life and well. My older brother, Joseph, he has also heart issues. My middle brother, Felix, uh, he died of a heart-related problem. Victor is only, he doesn't have a heart issue, but he has vascular disease. And I myself, I have some very strong history. As you can tell, family history lives very much in our family. And is it a surprise that I now, you know, I'm a cardiologist? Possibly not. Anyhow, I went to all the schools in, uh, in Switzerland, and then I graduated from, in, from Zurich, Switzerland School in uh, 1977. And, um, and that's, uh, I finished all my training in, in Switzerland. And in that moment, I decided to jump over the big ocean and then come to uh, the United States. So since graduating from medical school in 1977, I know um, that was about 10 years or a little more before coronary stents and balloon angioplasty took off, but certainly it was being investigated. Um, heavily in animal studies probably. Nonetheless, I'm very interested to know how is it that you went from medical school graduation in 1977 in Switzerland to becoming the esteemed cardiologist, uh, opening up blockages uh, without bypass surgery uh, in the United States. Tell us that story. You're right. So in 1977, it turns out, the year that I graduated, it was the year that Dr. Andreas Grinzik did the first coronary balloon angioplasty. You see here, Dr. Grinzik with his balloon. That was in one of the big, uh, the popular magazine in Zurich that he was featured. And uh, that was the year that I graduated and then decided to come to the United States. This is a picture of that very first patient that was done in 1977. What you see is an angiogram with those coronary arteries. You see a blockage here. The same blockage is once again displayed. And you can see here in the, this particular photograph that how the balloon was inflated. It was a long like a balloon, like a sausage. And then after the balloon was deflated, you see how that blockage is completely disappear. Blockage before, blockage afterwards. What you have here is like pressure recordings. So that was a very important year, 1977, when Dr. Grinzik did that. Now, in terms of the history, how did he, he just didn't uh, invent this overnight. It is a long, long history that led to this uh, invention of the balloon angioplasty. And as a matter of fact, the real granddaddy of uh, intervention is this fellow, Dr. Charles Darter, who practiced at OHSU in Portland who uh, uh, had actually published many many years before in fact in 1964 Dr. Charles T. Dodder published in circulation uh, that uh, he had figured out a procedure how we can open up blocked leg arteries with a special catheter 
and, and that catheter allowed him to reestablish flow in people who would have lost their leg and, and, and would have needed an amputation. This procedure, unfortunately, didn't really take um, you know, roots in the United States. And in fact, Dr. Zeitler, uh, from, from the United States, that procedure came to Europe. Dr. Zeitler was a radiologist. Dr. Grinzig was his fellow. He learned from him. So he went to the Europe. And, and um, in, in Europe, Dr. Grinzig, he and now featured with Dr. Dodder, Charlie Dodder, that started in 1964, ultimately lead to the development of a, of a balloon that Dr. Grinzig personally uh, pushed forward. His, his idea was to open up arteries, but not with a cattle like Dr. Dodder did, but with a small little balloon. In fact, this was one of his first rendition of how he thought we could tie a piece of plastic at the end of a tube and he kind of with a little lighter you know burned it off so there was not air escaping and then there was a little slit there so he tried multiple different uh, um, reiteration of uh, how he ended up with the balloon and here's a schematic uh, picture of how balloon angioplasty works you have an artery here that's blocked you have a little soft very soft wire that fl that gently crosses it because it's flexible it doesn't do any damage and then you fall out with a catheter the catheter is then positioned right here it turns out that's where the balloon is the balloon gets inflated and then the balloon gets deflated and as you take everything out you see that blockage that was right here that's the noses as we call it as well as now uh, completely opened up that's the Grinzig procedure that he did in 1977 this was one of his uh, first uh, associate uh, Maria Schlumpf and they literally you know manufactured those first balloons on the kitchen table with lots of PVC tubing and glue and super glue and of course a good bottle of Swiss wine as well this happens to be the the, the very first patient Adolf Bachmann he was 30 I believe 37 years old or so one week after he had his coronary artery blockage fixed which was unbelievable at the time because if you had to have a coronary artery fixed you were in the hospital for about at least three weeks then you had to go to rehab another three weeks you wouldn't go swim in a, a week later so i just want to show you that picture of this very first patient adolf bachman so i graduated in 1977 as i told you several times now but then i moved to the united states uh, i realized that the training in the United States is extremely uh, well developed. It's very structured and it's easy to learn. You go to a certain process. And I ended up in Flint, Michigan. Of course, no, everybody knows about Flint, Michigan these days. Back then, Flint was only known for his big GM factory plants. I went then to Detroit where I did my internal medicine training. You have to be an internist before you can become a cardiologist. And I did that in those three years. Later on, then I moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I worked at the medical college from 1983 to 85. In, in 1983, I was ready to, to leave my training and start, you know, supporting my family. At that time, we had, we, we had, to three, uh, we had three children, and so, you know, money was in short supply, and I was ready to, to become a regular cardiologist when I learned that Dr. Grinzig actually moved from Zurich, Switzerland to Atlanta, Georgia, where he worked at the Emory University, and... Um, I had his ID that I should see if I could work with him as a fellow. And uh, of course, I envisioned uh, piles and piles of fellows who wanted to apply and they all get denied. And, and I figured out, what if I write him a letter in German, then there's a good chance that um, if I write it in German, he will, he will have to read it. So he said, I just won't put it in the pile of denials. And, and lo and behold, he ends up calling me at home and, and they told me, yeah, if you want to come on down, you go, I'll work with you and, and, the, and the rest is uh, history. So Dr. Grinzig really gave me a job and I worked with him at Atlanta Emory University from 83 to 85. Well, there he is at Emory University. Unfortunately, as you can see, he died very young at age 46. Dr. Grinzig also was, a, uh, he was very supportive of his people. This is a picture. At Christmas, he opened up his big, you know, mansion, a typical uh, southern uh, 
you know, United States Southern Georgia mansion with um, all the children of all the employees were invited. Santa Claus came and we were singing some Christmas carols uh, at the end uh, of that evening. I was also very fortunate that I was able to, um, to um, excuse me here, to uh, publish a lot of uh, research at that time it was, since it was all new. But then, as I told you, Dr. Gunsig died young on October 27, 1985. He was a, a pilot that he loved so much, and unfortunately, he he died in, in a plane crash. Him and his wife both together. It was in 1985, very tragic because 1985 is also a year that we lost three other uh, pioneers in cardiovascular care. One is Dr. Judkins. Dr. Judkins was a radiologist who, until this day, we use his catheters to do an angiogram. Of course, Dr. Grinsick, who you know now, is Dr. Mason Sones, who did the first coronary angiogram injecting dye into a coronary artery in October 30, 1958. And of course, here's Dr. Charlie Dada. It's, it's just a very bizarre that all of those four guys died in the same year of 1985, but that's that is uh, what happened. Wow. Dr. Lyme Gruber, so when Dr. Grenzen died in 1985, tell us the story from that point to your moving to Spokane, Washington. How is it that you decided to move to Spokane, Washington, and what makes Spokane so special? There you go. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So here it is when you are a fellow, you know, you look for jobs and usually is a next to the main of cardiology office. There are, there's a poster and, and people who request a, a trained fellow to join them. They, they post those letters on request and you read them and you see if something is there. And I, and I saw a letter from, from Dr. Shields group in Spokane, a cardiology group, and they were looking for a fellow that's trained how to do balloon angioplasty. So that's where I went from Emory University to Spokane, Washington, and as you appropriately asked, why Spokane? I think I need to give you a little background as to why Spokane was intriguing to me to go there. And I saw the ad, I said, huh, Spokane. Isn't Spokane where they did the heart surgery for many, many years? And yes, indeed, they did. And in fact, the first heart surgery was done on June 6, 1952. It was a patient by the name of Barbara Envold. She's now long dead, of course. You know, but the, they did a closed mitral commissurotomy. In other words, they did they worked on a beating heart without. They didn't have any hard lung machine at that time, so the procedure that was done by Dr. Ralph Berg. He was a cardiologist. I mean, a, a heart surgeon, born and raised in Spokane, trained at Mayo Clinic, came back to Spokane and became then the preeminent heart surgeon. This is the procedure that they did in 1952. You see, Dr. Berg sticks his finger across the mitral valve that's narrowed because of rheumatic fever. The heart is still beating. He has a little uh, um, string or a tourniquet around where he sticks his finger so the blood wouldn't just gush out. And as the heart was beating, he quickly opens up that valve with his finger. And that used to be called a closed commissurotomy because that did not require um, an open heart machine. This is Dr. Berg, as he did surgery in the 50s and in the 60s with his assistant there in the operating room. And Dr. Berg also was working on the first heart-lung machine that was developed in the late 1950s. This is a, one of those prototypes of a heart-lung machine where you can actually stop the heart beating. You can stop the lungs from having to require oxygen and you artificially provide the oxygen into the bloodstream with this heart lung machine that takes over and then the heart is very quiet and you can operate on the heart. He was very successful, Dr. Berg, and in fact in 1959, January 10th, so we had just had a 60th uh, anniversary for the first open heart surgery that was done in a 39-year-old uh, lady. And here's the first Operative report, you can see January 10, 1959, Dr. Burke, Cleveland, Kaufman Lang, Sister Mark, and, and so forth, and uh, uh, Betty Larson was one of the, the person that uh, helped him. Repair of an atrial septal defect through right to academy with bypass and open heart surgery. Surgery started at 10.30 and lasted till 4.30. See, six hours of uh, Surgery nowadays, the same procedure probably will take about 45 minutes to do. And so it was the very first, very, very successful. In fact, this is Dr. Berg uh, at 1972, 
that this picture was taken. He was also an avid hunter. And, um, and this is my partner, Dr. Paul Shields, who in 1961 arrived in Spokane as the first uh, cardiologist uh, in the city. Dr. Shields is absolutely a pioneer. As a, I'm a big fan of Dr. Shields. He's still alive. He just had his 90th birthday last month. And he back in, the, you know, even in 1970s, he was convinced that atherosclerosis is not just deposit of fat. It's actually an inflammatory process. Mm. I also want to tell you that Dr. Shields in 1966 did the first coronary angiogram. You remember the first coronary angiogram in the world was done in 1958. So eight years later, he did his first one in the at Deaconess Medical Center. It wasn't just the first one in Spokane, it was the first coronary angiogram that was ever done in the state of Washington, Seattle. They didn't do any coronary angiogram at times. Spokane was that place where they start really advancing cardiovascular care, thanks to people like Dr. Burke and Dr. Shields. I knew about those people, they published information, that's why Spokane for me had had a ring to it, I mean, I wanted to explore it. I want to see, is it really that good as they claim? As a matter of fact, they, they published um, uh, important information. I'm gonna move this a little bit here for you guys. So uh, they published acute myocardial infarction is a surgical emergency, or a heart attack is a surgical emergency. In fact, they operated on a patient that had a heart attack. The first one was on in 1971. And, um, and at that time, people were thinking, this is, has got to be uh, malpractice. How can you take a patient with a heart attack into surgery? That's highly unorthodox. Nobody was daring doing that. The surgeons were so good that they were actually able to do that. And they published their one-year mortality. You know, that was, uh, let's see here. I'm going to see how this the one-year mortality with not doing a bypass at that time was 30%. A third of the people died. Once you had a heart attack, you had about a one in three chances of making it, okay? Now, if you did surgery, look at that. The, 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 the one-year mortality was 6.3%. Look at the difference. So heart surgery was, in their hands, in Spokane, highly, highly, highly effective, okay? So I just wanted to see if I can move that here again to the side here. Anyhow, so uh, that's what was happening in Spokane. They did emergency heart surgery. I knew about it. I wanted to first find out, is it really true what they do? Okay, and in, in fact, this is the article that was published in 1980 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which really made a tremendous impact in the entire world because the, the, the surgeons and the cardiologists in Spokane were identifying a clot that was retrieved, removed with a small little balloon catheter out of the arteries of patients who, who came into the, to the hospital uh, with, with, a, with a heart attack, okay? So that's what happened in Spokane. I liked what I saw. I was convinced those guys are the real deal. And it's not just some kind of fly-by-night group that does some crazy stuff. And so I joined the Dr. Shields' group, and I worked with balloon angioplasty, of course. And then later on, we had laser. We had other devices that we tried to open up. Already, and of course, in 93, then the coronary stents were developed. And this is what a coronary stent looks like. It's like a metal mesh, like a scaffold that is and put inside the artery to keep the artery open. The balloon was able to open up the arteries, but often the artery would collapse. And then you had a, an emergency that you would have to then fix with a bypass, which was always very traumatic. Since then came around, that, that, that rarely happened that you had to take a patient to surgery. I'm gonna show you the very first patient that had a coronary stent in 1987 that was still experimental, that was done at Emory. You know, you see an artery that was really badly blocked, and then they did, you know, they did a balloon, and it really opened up a little bit, but not very well, and you can then see how this artery completely just collapsed. And that patient, 15 minutes after the procedure, has chest pain, he has EKG changes, as called as ST segment elevation, and at that point, you know, up to 1987, that patient would have been rushed to the operating room, an emergency stenotomy where you have to enter this, the, the bones in the front of your chest and do a bypass, okay? 
Well, guess what they did? They were able to refine the, the small little wire through the blockage. They put the stent in there and look at how nicely the artery after the GR2, GR stent, giant tocorubin stent was the name of that very first bailout stent that was actually used in the first patient. So another thing that happened in, uh, in Spokane was the development of coronary artery calcium test or coronary artery scoring, CAC score for coronary artery disease. Uh, our group, Dr. Shields, together with the radiologist, purchased the first ultra-fast CT scanner that allowed us to look at coronary arteries and look and see if they, uh, the patient has calcification in, in, in their arteries. And this was a, a breakthrough because we could look into the heart without doing an angiogram. And this is the abstract that I was able to publish in the American Journal of Cardiology in uh, 1993. And uh, the, 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 the big supporters of coronary artery calcium score was Dr. Byron, Dr. Paul Shields, because my group, I, did, I put all this information together. And there's another colleague of two colleagues of mine. What we, what we were able to show and I'm not sure I can move this here, but that's okay. Uh, okay, here it is. Let's put it a little bit out of the way here. What we're able to show is that this is a group of patients who had normal arteries. This had mild coronary disease. They had one vessel disease, two vessel, and three vessel disease, where all three arteries were blocked. In the white column, you see the calcium score. In the little uh, um, uh, hashed area, you see how many lesions are were identified. And it's not surprising that the more blockage you have, the more calcium you will have, you know, in the heart arteries. But look at this group here. Those were normal coronary arteries. We found that about uh, in that group, the calcium score was close to 100. And we found about five, six lesions in those people. They, we thought they had normal arteries. And this was my last comment there in 1993, coronary artery calcification in patients with normal coronary angiograms may suggest earliest manifestation of coronary artery, uh, uh, coronary artery disease, okay? So I wanna show you what happened. Those individuals listed here were only a few of the folks who used coronary CT scanning in Washington, in Spokane, Washington at that time. And another doctor was Dr. Bradley Bale. He immediately realized, Dr. Bale was working as a primary care physician at that time in, in Spokane, and he realized the importance of a coronary artery calcium score in demonstrating subclinical, that means the earliest findings of atherosclerosis, of plaque buildup in the heart arteries, and he immediately realized its value by using this in patients in order to prevent heart attack and stroke by giving them the earliest uh, imp intervention, the earliest uh, you know, recommendation as far as the cholesterol, weight, and so forth. And of course, you all know Dr. Bradley Bale. That's why it's called the bale Donin method. But that happened in Spokane because we had a coronary calcium score. That was the first way that we can look inside the patient's uh, arteries you know, nowadays we do a bit carotid uh, IMT scan, but coronary calcium score actually preceded that way back then. Okay, so after that, I also worked on carotid stents uh, where we have blockages in the carotid artery. You can see this is a main carotid, common carotid artery. It is the artery that goes into the brain. That patient will be at risk for a stroke. And we were able to actually open those blockages with a long stent that we placed right across that blockage. And at the end, the artery was wide open, as you can see. And that was an exciting time for me because I was fortunate enough that I was able to participate in nationally well-known journals like the New England Journal in publications that um, talked about the, the, the importance of uh, carotid stenting. In 1997, there was this particular headline. It says, is cardiology flatlining? Mostly talking about how there was nothing new being developed. I mean, it seemed to get to a point, you know, where progress was really slow. Of course, it has since progressed again. And then, you know, everybody thought that we should really look into public health. And, and that is kind of um, where I made some cr critical decision at that time what to do next.
Dr. Leimgruber, that is uh, that history, even though it's the second time I've heard you present it, is so incredibly interesting to me. And you're right, over this sh relatively short period of time, the medical advances that were made and the refinement of the procedures and the, and the uh, tools used to carry out the procedure, just amazing. And it continues to be life-saving, certainly in the heart attack arena today, when someone presents to the hospital with a heart attack, certainly you want to cardiologist such as yourself that's an interventionist well trained that and a team around that person uh, that knows exactly what to do because uh, taking someone to the cardiac cath lab catheterization laboratory and getting that blockage opened up if, as you've shown us on these slides is what will save that person's life today um, so it has saved a lot of lives that's for sure Extension of life is another thing, and quality of life is another thing. But anyway, I digress. I just, I love this history. I love this story. Love to hear more from you. But my question now is, revolves around your uh, transition, if you will. You know, I, um, in case those uh, individuals listening to us don't really understand the cardiology training, a general cardiologist, if you will, um, sees patients in the clinical setting, one that takes an additional uh, amount of training can do the diagnostic procedure of cardiac catheterization or coronary angiography where dye is injected into the heart like these pictures you've showed us today to diagnose a blockage that may or may not need a stent and then an additional fellowship of two to three years I believe you'll tell us is required to become what's called an interventional cardiologist which you've had a a, a long and respected and uh, just an esteemed career as an interventional cardiologist, not only advancing the technology, but performing life-saving procedures on thousands of patients. Uh, that was your life every day for years. So tell us how you made the decision. Maybe it was quick. Maybe it was a slow process to go from interventionalist to your current practice, which is uh, totally a preventionalist, if you will. Absolutely. So, um I am, I'm glad you um, you asked me that question. Obviously, exactly. I went from intervention to prevention, or from, as Dr. Amy likes to say, from luminology to arteriology, and um, and um, so that's what happened when I joined Dr. Amy Donin in, in April of, of uh, 2017 in in, uh, in a heart attack and stroke prevention center. I just want to show you in that same year of 2017. Here's the Adolf Bachmann. Adolf Bachmann is now 40 years later, still alive, and he never had anything, no bypass surgery. He had that very first balloon. Uh, my wife and I were fortunate to attend that uh, celebration at the anniversary in Zurich, Switzerland, as one would expect to celebrate the 40-year anniversary. I also want to show you, before we get into the, the prevention field, a couple of slides which are dear to me. Those are my five children. This is uh, fishing in Alaska in 2011. My youngest daughter is now a CRNA. And I got a couple of lawyers here, and this, uh, this, uh, a kindergarten teacher. And one works for, for Caterpillar. They're all doing wonderful. I'm very blessed uh, in that. And this is my latest edition. This is my little Wyatt as my grandson, the 21 uh, months old. It was done last, like a week ago with his fireman suit in, in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Now here we have another picture that you all are familiar with, Dr. Bale, Dr. Amy Dunin. And then we have Dr. Paul Shields, also in 1970, I mean 2017, excuse me, uh, where we had a reunion, the three of us, Dr. Bale, uh, knows Dr. Steele's very well and vice versa. We had a wonderful evening. I just want to show you this picture here and then I can um, uh, tell you in terms of um, where we are with um, with the, tra the transition uh, into, so maybe, okay, if I can bring this up. Okay, is that okay for you? Does that work? Or how should we That's do it? That's absolutely fine, yes. We can, all right. All right. Oh, um, is there any way we can... Do uh, do you all see the big? Okay, so there we go. So I'll tell you what happened is <clears throat> why did I switch from from intervention to prevention? Is what was your question, right, Gina? I want to go back to that, and uh, and the reason is actually quite simple. Uh, Doctor Amy asked me if I would would like to join her in her practice. So that was a tremendous opportunity for me and uh, to work in the prevention field. So how did I, how did Amy uh, do that to me? Well, I tell you why. You know, um, when I had my triple bypass surgery in 1996, 
I, I started to be Dr. Brad Bale, and then later on, Dr. Amy Dunin. So I was intimately familiar with the Bale Dunin method. I, I knew it would work. I was fortunately enough, and to this day, I'm fortunate enough to, to benefit from that in a, in a big way. So for me, the decision was not, well, you know, what's, what's up with this Bale Dunin? I knew what was up with it. You know, it does work. I was uh, uh, personally benefiting from, from the Bale procedure and so that is why when she offered me the job I quit my interventional cardiology job and I completely focused on prevention I also realized Gina that in order to to make an impact we have to start with the prevention it's wonderful all the things we can do with stents and balloons and you know emergency uh, bypass and valves and so forth but ultimately it would make a lot more sense you know, if we can prevent this from happening. So that is why I felt I need to grab this opportunity. Yes, I'll have to learn quite a bit more. You know, the uh, prevention is a, a field that requires a lot of knowledge and, and a lot of teaching and coaching and, and monitoring and investigation. And, and that intrigued me. And that's why I made the, 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 the switch from, from intervention to prevention. So, Dr. Limegruber, you first started seeking out prevention for yourself after you had a bypass surgery in 1996? 1996, that is correct. Dr. Bale was practicing, that was before Amy joined him, and uh -huh. then uh, as Dr. Bale was uh, called to Texas, you know, to, um, to the faculty there, and, uh, and, um, and that's when I continued with, then with Amy, nice. uh, also ever since then, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you had personal experience before deciding to make a career change. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I was ready to make a change. I was, but then as this offer showed up, then I said, "This is this is really what you know what it's all about." You know, mm -hmm. I was able to continue to to help people at the beginning as opposed to at the end of their process, and that's what really got me fascinated and, right. and interested. Correct. So I know in the hospital setting, those listening who work in the emergency room or the cardiac catheterization laboratory or even the OR, um, there is somewhat of an adrenaline rush or it's a very exciting job when someone comes to the emergency room near death or perhaps with sudden cardiac death, the worst presentation of a heart attack, if you will, or even just you know excruciating chest pain and you see there's no blood flow and it opens up and you know everybody's thrilled because you've saved a life right mm -hmm. saved cardiac muscle and uh it's it's very exciting so if you would compare and contrast your job as an interventionist to that as a provincialist and do you like your new job i mean just bottom line tell us are you loving it or uh how's it going absolutely very it's a very good question and Believe me, it wasn't easy to make that switch in the very beginning, you know, I missed that adrenaline rush. But let me tell you, uh, the prevention is very, very rewarding. And I, since I practice now for two years with, um, with Dr. Amy next to her, seeing patients, uh, seeing how people improve with their risks is absolutely almost like equally an adrenaline rush that, it, you know, because when I was before, I cannot tell you how many times we had patients who came back for the second time, for the third time, and you were thinking, my gosh, can't we do anything to stop this from happening again? Mm -hmm. And so seeing people making that incredible, you know, progress with the prevention, for me, I thought, I couldn't believe it. I didn't, I, I didn't know people could actually have an impact because all I saw was people coming back for the second and third time. I said, you know, and then I, I come here, I work here, I can see it is possible to have an impact. It is doable. People have it in their hands. They haven't, you know, they can do it. And I, I witness this every time I see a patient again, you know, I look at their numbers, they look at their lifestyle changes, they look at their dental, you know, issues, they look at their obstructive sleep apnea, they me it's, a tremendously rewarding, you know. I mean, now he'd be the same adrenaline rush and having those, you know, you know, those relatives' eyes starting to tear when I tell them, you know, their loved one is doing fine, you know. But, but seeing that it is possible it is a tremendously uh, rewarding. Furthermore, for me, I've always been a scientist. You know, I I published a lot of uh, articles in the past, 
and uh, I and I work here with science. You know, this is a scientifically based approach. It's not some mother Dr. Bale and Amy concocted. You know, no, they, everything is that it is being done is done because of literature of science, and of course they've been doing it for twenty plus years, and, and they have the experience that it's work. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. Obviously, so yes, so it, it is a uh, it also that. The patients are wonderful people, you know, and and you know, and I I have um, I have time to talk to them and I have time to listen to them. Before it was almost impossible to do any prevention. I wish I could have, you know, but I had to see the next patient who was about to have a heart attack. And so it's a whole different field. But the bottom line is, absolutely, I love the job. Why? Because I can see firsthand how it is possible to. Many people see that they're going to have huge benefit 20 years from now. You know, if they continue with this approach, they will unlikely uh, end up with that, you know, with that stent. And that's our goal. And as you know, Gina, this is, uh, this is what we see every day. You know, people are actually doing much, much better. Right. Very rewarding. And don't you think it's exciting, Dr. Lyme Gruber, that we have objective ways to measure improvement now? Um, it's not like we can say you look better, you've lost weight, or uh, wow, you can run two miles now, not just one. But we're looking at lab data, we're looking at uh, the wall of the artery. And so when someone's lab data looks scary, because we know now what scary lab work looks like, meaning they're at risk for a heart attack or stroke in the near term, the long term, and we see that markedly improve as well as uh, year to year, see the artery wall actually getting healthier, so arresting and reversing that um, what can be an aggressive disease process, vascular disease, atherosclerosis, or plaque, if you will. Um, it's it's an objective thing, so it's not maybe as dramatic on the page as those restoring restoring blood flow angiogram films like you showed us, but I get as excited about it when I'm in the room with the patient. Sometimes they even look at me a little bit funny, but I mean, it's cheers and hugs and because that's life-saving work. It really is. Well, there's, a, there's a good reason, uh, in my opinion, and I'm sure yours too, as to why, why the bail benign method works. You know, mm. it's not, you know it, it's very, meticulous it's a very uh, a very very discreet approach that our focus of course is like you say we have to find out if you have plaque or not if you have plaque your risk for a problem will substantially increase and that requires urgent attention and yes we do you know blood tests you know we actually numbers will show how well you do you can't hide it you know, if you do your blood test, it will show how well you did with exercise and diet. Mm -hmm. It will show if you have ongoing inflammation, you know, in your body. And if you do have that, we have to look and do detective work from head to toe to your gums, to your guts, to your, in, everywhere, you know. In, all those risk factors that we know have an influence, those root causes, as we as we call it in the Beldonin method. Once you do it methodically like this, that's when the results will show. It's not, you know, and, and like you said, oh, you look good, your blood pressure is good, make sure you exercise, I'll see you in a year. It's not, nothing is going to happen at that moment. We, we know that, but with this very close monitoring approach and looking at what's going on with your atherosclerotic process, it, it, it's, it, it does show the results are, are there. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. I can imagine that um, your work before was up early, rounding, and there at the hospital till late and long hours, and, and your job now is very different. Compare and contrast for us just a little bit about the difference in the work, work environment, your day-to-day -day activities, and anything else that you think we would find interesting about such a dramatic career change. Absolutely. Like you said, you know, I mean, I enjoyed my work before every day. I, I never mm -hmm. really you know, hated to go to work. You know, some days you were more tired than others, but you, I always found something enjoyable at the end of the day in spite of all the, the work. But I also have to say, you know, the focus was 100% different. You know, the, the focus bef uh, before was clearly, I got to make sure patients uh, do not have a heart attack in terms of a stent. I had to make sure the blood flow is maintained in the heart arteries. 
very it's very busy you know the, the, today the cardiologists they see many many patients they need help they have nurse practitioners as you know and it requires a huge team and as I told you before I had people who came back second third and fourth and sometimes more times and 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 so here I would think I got to try see if I can prevent this from happening well when you see a patient with five problems, they have heart failure, they have atrial fibrillation, irregular heart rate, I mean, they have high blood pressure, they have high cholesterol and whatnot. And at the end of the 15 minutes visit, you have to talk about prevention. You can imagine which section of that 15 minutes took precedent. It was the one about do you need a stent or you don't need a stent. So you're focusing on intervention. You really did not have time, you know, to really practice prevention. You know, prevention is not something that we expect the interventional cardiologist necessarily to do. What I expect the interventional cardiologist to do is get that stent in as quickly as possible and get that patient out of the cat lab and, and prevent him from having a lot, a lot of heart damage. And that's what they do well. Prevention, it's, it would be nice, but it's, it's not practically to expect to have a regular busy cardiologist to be successful in the prevention field you know so that is the big contrast now i'm completely focusing on prevention i have a time to listen to a patient i have time to talk to a patient time to educate the patient time to go to the lab results one by one time to sketch out a plan at the end of the visit what is your Next step, what do we expect when you come back? What are you going to tell me you're going to do differently, if so? Or maybe you're going to continue to do the same thing because you're doing it well, you know? So that opportunity to, uh, to be participating and seeing this patient's eye lit up, you know, when they come back with their beautiful results and, and how they were able to beat it and, you know, their, their risk is getting better. And that is also, that is the difference between now and before before it was the adrenaline rush and now it's it's a prevention and you know i really feel that it it's a complementary approach you know if, if we want to really help patient we have to prevent the problem can we prevent on every one problems probably not now maybe in 10 20 years probably so that's why we will need we need the interventional folks we need the preventive folks you know we we really should be working side by side and so everybody should accept that each other's skills and use them appropriately to get the best bang for the buck. Not everybody has to do everything. You don't know, you know, not everybody has to be, you know, and that's why we have obstetricians who deliver babies, you know, even though a doctor used to deliver those. Nowadays, they don't. There's only special specialists to do it. And I think the prevention specialist is the one that should really focus on that and take the time to do it and not expect to do a stent. We want him to do prevention and vice versa. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, uh, a few cardiologists practicing the Baldonine method now, totally into prevention. Uh, and we have several that are certainly supportive of it. I know in Texas, the cardiology group, the interventional cardiology group has been my biggest referral source. Mm -hmm. Is there any messages like, like that or others that you would give to your former colleagues at the hospital? Um, I'm, I'm very excited to see that, you know, cardiologists are taking on the, the prevention field, you know, and, um, and I think what you just told me about in Texas, the group that refers you, that is the perfect situation. You know, they mm -hmm. recognize your skills, you know, they recognize what you can add to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the patient is the one that, that benefits. So mm -hmm. the ones that are switching from cardiology to prevention, you know, if they can do that full time, that's it's fantastic because they have the knowledge. They know what the background will be if somebody doesn't do prevention. So they have a clearly a advantage like I do. You know, if I tell patients, you know, if, if you don't do this, I mean, I can tell you what it's going to look like 10 years from now. So, yes, so that's, that's encouraging to see cardiologists. But also, I think what you just said there about the you know, group in Texas, that's clearly the message. You know, we need to work together. We need the team approach. You know, if you can do better with prevention, have at it. You know, you take care of my patients. I'm the cardiologist who, who watches their blood flow. You know, if you can 
prevent that blood flow from occurring in the first place or stabilizing, and you know better than I do, I want you to do it. And, you know, and that's the way it should be. And I believe strongly in my heart that that's the goal that we will achieve and eventually will accomplish as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Very mm -hmm. exciting. Well, uh, Dr. Gruber, thank you so much for being with us today. Your message was so important and well presented. And I know we have several topics for upcoming shows, so you'll be back on. Uh, and I appreciate it so much. Any other, any other topics or anything else you'd like to touch on? Or is that good for our history of, and your transition? The history, I think this this whole field is absolutely exploding. You know, there's so yeah. many areas that we will, that Dr. Bale and Dr. Amy always talk about every month in their scientific updates, which is absolutely fascinating. And that kind of commitment that they have, that they provide us with the latest. I mean, every month you think, oh, I need to learn more about Alzheimer's. I need to learn about dementia. I need to learn more about periodontal disease. Oh, I need to know more about the gut biomes. I need to know more about obstruct the sleep at me. I mean, this is absolutely an exciting field. I mean, I don't think you're going to run out of topics, you know, for your, for your podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> and I, I'm glad to help you out and as one more come down the pike. But it was a pleasure to be able to talk to, to you and the folks that will be listening. And um, I'm certainly available for anybody to, to have questions. I'm sending it my way for sure. Jim. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. The comments that you just made made me think of uh, your article that you spoke about earlier is cardiology flatlining. You know, uh, I would say no, but it's only if you are a preventional cardiologist or a preventionist that it's not flatlining because a lot of people think it's boring. I, I am thrilled to go to work every day and it's so exciting as you've just uh, articulated there to hear those scientific updates because the data is coming out on a daily basis and every month there's more incredibly great studies on prevention and how we can do our job better and save more lives uh, than, than Dr. Baylor, Dr. Donine can fit into an hour uh, scientific session. So it is very exciting. And I, uh, I get that same, uh, when we all get together and we do talk about our practices and how to take better care of patients, et cetera, it is that same atmosphere as you, if you will, and you probably experienced this too, as it was back in the 1980s when we were like, yay, we've got stents coming. I can't wait till they're no longer under an investigational study only, but available to everyone because it's going to save lives. And, you know, we were just, I was thrilled to be uh, on the scene about the same time as you out of nursing school, going through the critical care internship at Baylor. And I'm like, I want I want to be in the cath lab. I want to save lives. And then you're right. After a while, it's like after 20 years of that, yes, okay, we're saving lives, certainly in the acute setting when they present with a heart attack, but then they come back again and again and again. And what can we do to keep them from coming back and having more and more procedures? And that first procedure oftentimes is the beginning of the end of a, and a life of multiple uh, readmissions to the hospital. So, uh, and then now we know we can keep that from happening with the bail donning method, as well as then people that are even incredibly high risk because of what maybe they've seen their parents or their grandparents go through. They say, I'd never want to go through it in the first place. We know that we can prevent that the first time. So um, I don't think cardiology is flatlining, but you got to move over to prevention. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's exactly what it is. We have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and be learning more and more and more. If you just stay on the surface, you will realize maybe it is flatlining, but as you dig deeper, you realize it's a whole new world that opens up. And that's where we need to dig in. And that's where we're going to have an impact on the surface. It may be flat, but it's a lot more exciting down below. And that's why it's so exciting to be in prevention. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. That's right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Gina. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.